happy Saturday. Before we get into today's Saturday Classic, just a quick reminder, we have a live streaming event coming up on March 10th. You can find all the information about that and buy tickets at loopedlive.com. We also have the ticket link pinned up at the top of our Facebook and our Twitter. We are super excited and hope folks will join us for that. Okay, coming up, we have an episode on Mary Sidney Herbert, Countess of Pembroke, who is the first woman known to have published an English language play. That happened in 1592. And as we were recording this forthcoming episode, I had a moment where I thought, when did Afra Ben do this same thing? The answer is almost 80 entire years later. <laughs> Mary Sydney, your title is safe. Um, aside from that, Afra Ben's life of spy work and writing was a pretty exciting one, so we are bringing that episode out as today's Saturday Classic. It originally came out on March 27th, 2017. Enjoy! Welcome to Stuff You Missed in History Class, a production of iHeartRadio. Hello, and welcome to the podcast. I'm Tracy V. Wilson. And I'm Holly Fry. Today's podcast is a request from many listeners, once again, and they include Georgia, Bree, Laura, Anna, Lauren, and Tabitha, who asked for it after I'd actually already started working for on it, and I'm sure many other people. It moved up to the top of the list after uh, sort of tangentially coming up in our Ira Frederick Aldridge episode. Aldridge played a character called Orinoco in The Revolt of Suriname, and that was an adaptation of the play Orinoco by Thomas Southern, and that was an adaptation of Orinoco, a short work of fiction by today's subject, Afra Ben. There is really not a lot that's conclusively known about the life of Afra Ben, who, in addition to being a spy, was also a dramatist and a poet, a novelist, a translator, and uh, probably the first woman in English literature known to have made a living as a writer. Even though she was prolific in her work, her gender meant that the sorts of institutions that were mostly keeping up with the details of writers' and artists' lives at the time did not really include her. Since she wasn't an aristocrat, there was no official family history, and she didn't really keep a diary or write a memoir or, or correspond in a lot of letters, at least not many that actually survived. And yet, even though there is so little concrete information... She's the subject of multiple biographies, and some of them are quite lengthy. Uh, With so little actual documentation to go on, a lot of these sort of pick up tiny pieces of the historical record and then try to glean details of her life from her written work. And this means that a lot of biographies about her are very heavily subject to interpretation. They tend to be influenced a lot by the biographer's focus and their interpretation of her body of work. Uh, And in some cases, if you've read the words probably and may have, you've read like a quarter of the thing at least. (laughs) So so we're going to do our best on this one. I feel like you're describing some sort of Afrobed biographical Mad Libs. (laughs) <laughs> it kind of is. I mean, every biography is influenced by the biographer. Right. Even if you're trying, you know, even if the biographer is trying really hard to have a very objective stance, this is particularly true with Afroben because there's so much that's like trying to piece together a teeny little puzzle with itty bitty pieces to make a whole life out of. Yeah, with big gaps in the puzzle. Uh, So it won't surprise you, having listened to that introduction, that there is very, very little known about Afra Ben's early life. And most of what we do know has been reconstructed, as Tracy just mentioned, by following the threads uh, available, a lot of which are other people's claims about her. And then uh, the logical conclusions are drawn from there. So it is generally agreed that she was born sometime around 1640, probably to a family who lived in Wye, a village in Kent, England. Colonel Thomas Culpepper claimed that Afra Ben's mother was his wet nurse, and her father was reported to be a barber. So this makes the most likely candidates for her parents, Bartholomew and Elizabeth Johnson. They had a daughter, Efrey, spelled E-A-F-F-R-E-Y, and that was one of the many, many variations in spelling for the name Afra at the time. This young Efrey was baptized on December 14th of 1640, although some sources report that as the day of her birth. 
With her mother as his wet nurse, Afra would have been considered Thomas Culpepper's foster sister, and the Culpeppers were a prominent family in the area. This connection to the Culpeppers would have given Afra access to far more educational opportunities and a wider social circle than she would have had as just the daughter of a wet nurse and a barber. Although we don't have a lot of details about the specifics of her childhood and her adolescence, we do know that Afra grew up during a period of huge chaos and change. The English Civil Wars began when she was still a toddler, and this is a series of wars that obviously could be at least a whole episode all by themselves. So very briefly, the English Civil Wars also involved Scotland and Ireland, and they grew out of a conflict between King Charles I and Parliament about who ultimately had control over the military following an uprising in Ireland. During the English Civil Wars, the Parliamentarians faced off against the Royalists in a series of conflicts that ultimately led to a victory for the Parliamentarians, the execution of Charles I in 1649, the exile of his son Charles II, and the political rise of Oliver Cromwell, first Lord Protector of the Commonwealth of England, Scotland, and Ireland. The total death toll in England was almost 200,000. Obviously. That is a t- was like the tiniest possible description of the English Civil Wars. During the interregnum years that followed, from 1649 to 1660, the nation was no longer actively at war with itself, but it still had its fair share of strife. Many of those in Parliament were Puritans, and they started enforcing Puritan standards and views for the rest of the nation. Cromwell himself had a reputation as a radical and a fanatic, and his actions during the Civil Wars had included, among other things, a massacre in Ireland. Throughout the Interregnum, Royalists continued to work toward the goal of restoring the monarchy. There's some speculation that toward the end of the Interregnum, Ben was already beginning her career as a spy by secretly carrying messages for Royalist organizations. She would have been connected to these organizations once again through Thomas Culpepper. Oliver Cromwell died in 1658, and by 1661, Charles II had been returned to the throne, so by the time Afra Ben hit her 20s, England had already been through a lot. And with Charles II's return, English life dramatically changed once again. In a lot of circles, the restoration was met with a huge, hedonistic, fairly drunken party, and it was in this environment that Afra Ben really flourished a whole lot more than during uh, the more puritanical interregnum years. In 1663, when she was in her early 20s, Ben traveled to Suriname, and this would later become the setting for her work of fiction, Orinoco. Orinoco is often discussed as part of Ben's earlier work because her visit there would have happened, as we just said, when she was in her early 20s. But in reality, this piece wasn't published until shortly before her death. Orinoco tells the story of a prince from the Gold Coast in what is now Ghana. He was invited aboard a ship and then enslaved before being sold in Suriname, and that's where he meets the book's narrator. This narrator is an English woman who had come to Suriname with her father, but he died during the sea voyage. Some biographies actually take this plot point from Orinoco and apply it to Ben's real-life father. Although he had likely died by the early mid-1660s, it's completely unclear whether this aspect of Orinoco is supposed to be autobiographical. There's also debate about whether the book's narrator is supposed to be a stand-in for Ben herself. And that part's similarly foggy, but since Orinoco does contain a lot of detail about Suriname and people who really lived there in the 1660s, it's easy to think of it as evidence that the trip to Suriname really did happen, regardless of whether the story it tells is supposed to be autobiographical. Also, although Ben's own views on slavery are pretty hard to tease out from her writing, Orinoco itself was considered an abolitionist work of fiction in both the 18th and 19th centuries. Yeah, there are a lot of attempts to try to figure out what her racial views were based on the content of her writing. And the most logical conclusion is that she had a lot of the prejudices that were sort of ingrained in society, especially English society at the time. Um, And it's like when you read Orinoco, a lot of it is very sympathetic to the people who are enslaved in the book, but it's it's sort of a at most like 
proto-abolitionist text. Like, it was definitely read that way for a couple of centuries. But there's also a lot of stuff in it that, that is, you know, obviously laced with implicit biases and racism. Because it was written in the 6th, 7th, 17th century. Uh, even though Orinoco itself, as a book, didn't come out until much later, Afrobin was writing while in Suriname, including an early draft of a play called The Young King or A Mistake. Like several of Ben's other plays, it's a tragic comedy, and it tells a story of a royal brother and sister brought up in opposite roles because of a prophecy. The boy is, quote, kept from his infancy in a castle on a lake, ignorant of his quality and of all the world besides, never having seen any humane things save only his old tutor. While the girl is, quote, bred up in war and designed to reign in place of her brother. It plays around with gender and ideas of masculinity and femininity, which is a hallmark of Ben's later work as well. Ben's trip to Suriname wasn't particularly long. She returned to England in 1664. And not long after, she was given an audience with King Charles II to report on what she had witnessed there. It's not completely clear whether the king saw this as part of her spy career, but she definitely spied for him later. And we're going to start talking about that. But first, we're going to pause and have a little bit of a sponsor break. About the same time as she returned from Suriname in 1664, Afra Ben married a man whose name was, as you would conclude, Ben, or maybe Bean, described as, quote, a merchant of Dutch extraction. It might have been the Great Plague of London, which struck in 1665, that killed Ben's husband. He was dead by 1666. On top of the plague, England was once again at war. The Second Anglo-Dutch War began on March 4th of 1665. And this was part of a series of four wars between England and the Dutch Republic and their allies. The first three were largely trade wars, but the fourth was in response to Dutch involvement in the American Revolutionary War. Regardless of whether Ben had officially been doing spy work during the Interregnum or in Suriname, she definitely was during the Second Anglo-Dutch War, using the code name Astrea. Ultimately reporting to the Secretary of State, Lord Henry Bennett, she was assigned to travel to Antwerp, which is now in Belgium but was then in Spanish Netherlands, to meet with William Scott. Scott's father, Thomas, had been the man who signed Charles I's death warrant, for which he was later executed. And Scott himself was essentially acting as a double agent. He was gathering intelligence for England while also informing on the English to the Dutch. Armed with bribe money and the promise of a pardon, Ben's mission was to figure out whether Scott had worthwhile intelligence and, if he did, to get that intelligence back to England. Ben was likely chosen for this mission because she and Scott had met in Suriname. They had a bit of a flirtation there. In theory, this flirtation was nothing serious enough to jeopardize Ben's judgment, but it was enough of an existing con connection to Scott to sort of soften him up a little. She was given passage to Spanish Flanders and enough money to take care of her own needs during a short stay there. Her brother, who was in the military, was temporary, temporarily released from service to act as her chaperone. Apparently, Lord Bennett wasn't, wasn't aware that she was a widow, which would have given her a little more autonomy than an unmarried woman would have had. She received her money and instructions in July of 1666, and she was in Antwerp by August. But her time as a spy was not very successful. She flirted with Scott until he finally agreed to pass her information, but then he got her to agree to leave Antwerp and meet him in The Hague. And if she did that, not only was she very likely to be captured, but she was also sure to run out of her already dwindling supply of money. And this started the pair of them on a cycle of back and forth, with him getting her to agree to leave Flanders, and then her pulling back on that agreement. And another hiccup, this back and forth between Scott and Ben, also got tangled up with one William Corney, a merchant from Amsterdam who was also passing intelligence back to Lord Bennett. Before long, the three of them were just continually trying to undermine one another in this convoluted, backstabby triangle, word of which spread to London and started to threaten Ben's reputation. The idea that Ben's previous flirtation with Scott wouldn't be a threat to her also didn't really pan out. 
As Corny became a greater threat to both of them, they started to rely on and confide in each other in a way that didn't really leave Ben a whole lot of power to try to get the man to give her information. Eventually, Scott fled Flanders out of fear that Corny was going to kill him. And once he was gone, Corny focused all his attention on Ben, tailing her and forging reports in her name to discredit her. Scott wound up in prison, and although he did keep writing to Ben, he couldn't learn much while behind bars, and she had no way to pay for a passage home. When Scott was released from prison in 1667, he was also banished, leaving Ben with no way of getting whatever intelligence he still had. Throughout all of this, Ben was using ciphers and codes to send information back to London, but very little of this information was of actual value. She's often reported as having passed on a warning of the Dutch raid on Medway, which took place in June of 1667. This raid was a devastating blow to the British Navy. And while this is technically true, she did send that information. Other agents also delivered the same information, and none of it was heeded. Not even when another agent gave Lord Bennett a very specific warning about the upcoming attack after Ben had already returned to London. And getting back to London required Ben to beg for the funds to do so. She'd been so low on money that she'd handed over all her possessions to her innkeeper as collateral so she wouldn't lose her lodgings along with everything else. Although she was able to get a couple of loans to pay off the worst of her debts, it was only after numerous letters and lots of borrowing that she was able to get someone to pay for her passage. And it's unclear who that was, but it wasn't the administration that had sent her to Antwerp in the first place. Even though her spy life was not very effective, it still was pretty crummy that she was sent on this mission with no way of getting back home out of hostile territory. According to most accounts, after Afra Ben's return to England in the spring of 1667, she wound up in a debtor's prison. There's very little detail on this. She had written multiple letters to the people who had recruited her into the life of espionage and to other contacts that she had, all in an effort to pay off her debts. And it seems as though she either eventually did get someone to loan her enough money to get out of prison, or she made arrangements to pay her debt off gradually as she was able to earn enough money to do so. And the way that she earned that money was by writing. And we're going to talk about that after we once again pause for a quick sponsor break. After she got out of the debtor's prison, Afra Ben was able to make something of a fresh start for herself. By the summer of 1667, London had recently been through both the Great Plague and the Great Fire. And although the raid on Medway had taken place at the mouth of the Thames River and not up in the city, it had destroyed much of the British naval fleet and blockaded the city, which left the already shaken people living there feeling particularly defenseless. So in a fairly dispirited and anxious city, Ben was able to quietly make a space for herself, renting lodgings and working as a copyist, probably copying the sorts of material people would want handled with more discretion than a commercial printing press could allow. While copying definitely would have helped her make ends meet, it was not really enough to live comfortably, and soon Ben was also writing and publishing poems. She adopted her codename Estrella for a pseudonym for a lot of her written work as it was published at the time. Fortunately for Ben, King Charles II loved the theater, and he chartered two theater companies, known as the King's Company and the Duke's Company. The King's Company had the rights to a lot of existing plays, including works by Shakespeare and Ben Jonson. The Duke's company didn't, meaning there was a market for newly written plays. The plays themselves were often bawdy and blue, with women allowed on the stage rather than having female roles played by men. It's unclear exactly how Ben first got her foot in the door as a playwright. Through her spy work, she did know Thomas Killigrew, who was head of the King's Men and later the Master of the Revels. But it was the Duke's company and not the King's where her work first debuted. Her first play to be staged there was The Forced Marriage or The Jealous Bridegroom, a tragic comedy, which opened on September 20th, 1670. Ben was much savvier about playwriting as an occupation than she had been about her espionage career. 
She wanted to make sure she kept the rights to her plays, and she wanted them to be published, which would give her an additional source of income. Most of her plays were also published during her lifetime, although the first printing of The Forced Marriage, which was probably rushed to follow the play's performance and take advantage of that publicity, was full of errors. Errors as in things printed in completely the wrong order. (laughs) It was kind of a mess. Her next play to be staged opened just a few months later, and it was named The Amorous Prince. And like its name suggests, it's full of seductions, and it plays around a lot with gender and cross-dressing in a way that would become a frequent theme in Ben's works. Ben would go on to write 19 plays, including the two-part The Rover, with 17 of them staged during her lifetime. She wasn't the first woman to write for the British stage, but the idea of a woman playwright was still rare enough that her position was relatively unique, and she got a lot of criticism for the more risque content of her work, which was full of innuendo and double entendres. This was particularly true since, in both her plays and her novels, she seemed to blur the line between her narrator and herself. Even so, she pointed to similarities in the work of her contemporaries and predecessors as evidence that it would not have been frowned upon if she were a man. As the theater gradually fell a little bit more out of favor in the 1680s, Ben shifted her focus to writing novels, and she penned 16 works of fiction, all of which have narrators who are either obviously female or have no specified gender. She also continued to write poetry throughout her career. And although some of her poems were incorporated into her plays and fiction, many of them were meant for a smaller audience. They often contained inside references to what was going on in London society and politics, sometimes with names changed but otherwise easily recognizable to people in the know. Some of her poems were essentially social and political commentary rendered in verse, and only really understandable if you knew the context of what was going on around her. Much of Ben's work, especially in poetry, was romantic and sensual and even erotic, with both women and men as the subjects of her love poems, some of which also played with themes of androgyny and gender fluidity. The relationships depicted in her dramas are all over the map in terms of gender and sexual orientation. In terms of her personal life, her most public relationship uh, during her time as a writer was with John Hoyle, whose own life was was threaded through with lots and lots of scandal, including his relationships with other men. As Ben's writing career became more lucrative, she became increasingly more active in London society. She developed a reputation for being witty and charismatic and of liking to drink. She earned the nickname the Incomparable Astrea, and in her poetry, people called her the successor to Sappho. After more than 20 years making a living as a writer, Afra Ben died on April 16, 1689, at roughly 50 years old, A few days later, a piece called An Elegy Upon the Death of Mrs. A. Ben, the Incomparable Estrella, written by, quote, a young lady of quality, was published. It read in part, quote, Let all our hopes despair and die. Our sex forever shall neglected lie. Aspiring man has now regained the sway. To them we've lost the dismal day. The first biography of her came out in 1696, called Memoirs of the Life of Mrs. Ben by a Gentlewoman of Her Acquaintance. And that was part of her collected histories and novels, although its author was likely Charles Gilden. uh, This first biography is definitely a mix of embellishment, absolute total fiction, and a little bit of fact, and it was written in part to try to sell the collection of her work with which it was published. Even so, that and passages of her fiction that seem autobiographical have been picked up and repeated as fact over and over throughout the centuries. Although today Afra Ben is known as one of the 17th century's most influential playwrights and a groundbreaking writer in the genre of the novel, she fell sharply out of favor after her death. As the hedonism and licentiousness and that general drunken party flair of the Restoration became socially unacceptable, so did Afra Ben and her work. Critics decried her as a woman of loose moral character, and they condemned her work outright. That started to change, though, in the early 20th century, when the English writers and artists known as the Bloomsbury Group picked up her life and work as part of feminist history. 
poet and novelist Vita Sackville West wrote Afra Ben, The Incomparable Estrella, which was a biographical fiction that seems to treat Ben's life as a missed opportunity. Author Virginia Woolf wrote of her, quote, All women together ought to let flowers fall upon the tomb of Afra Ben, for it was she who earned them the right to speak their minds. It's kind of funny. They both seem to praise her so highly for having made a living as a writer uh, and uh, have an affinity for some of the like same sex content of her poems, and some of which are read as uh, like explicitly lesbian love poems. <laughs> but they have this theme, this sort of undertone of like, I wish she hadn't been writing such garbage right. in terms of like all this very coarse humor and body sexuality. Um, but you know, today I think folks are a lot, uh, a lot more accepting of that part of it than they maybe were in the 1900s. Yeah. Thanks so much for joining us on this Saturday. Since this episode is out of the archive, if you heard an email address or a Facebook URL or something similar over the course of the show, that could be obsolete now. Our current email address is historypodcast at iheartradio.com. Our old How Stuff Works email address no longer works. You can find us all over social media at Missed in History. And you can subscribe to our show on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, the iHeartRadio app, and wherever else you listen to podcasts. Stuff You Missed in History Class is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows. 